another game with white. And again, let's try to play another Scotch Gambit. Let's play another Scotch. Okay, so Philidor, great. Now, when facing the Philidor, we apply basic principles and it's pretty much common knowledge. The main move here is to play d4 and open up the center. There are bottom line rationale for that is that d6 is a passive move. It's not a horrible move, but it's passive because it closes down the bishop, doesn't develop a piece. The logical response to that is to open up the center. Okay. Knight d7, that's a move. And the problem, the secondary problem here is when you develop passively, you just don't have the resources to, to defend sometimes against a very quick onslaught. And you should associate onslaught in the opening with the f7 square because that's the only accessible square. So knight c3 is fine, but if we wanted to go for the quick kill, what should we do? Bishop c4 is correct. Good. Black should probably take, by the way. Yeah, so knight f6 is already bad. See, and this is the problem. Uh, well, it's not terrible. But now we can go knight g5, and he's going to have a very hard time to defend against. I mean, d5, e takes d5, and we're just up a pawn. Now, maybe there's some sort of theory here that I'm not aware of, but I think this is just bad, to be honest. Well, this is the fried liver, but it's a worse version for black because well, he's more passive. Okay. Knight b6 is good, but where should we go? Well, d6 has the cart before the horse. Our bishop is actually hanging. That's a good thought. Bishop b3 is possible, but I like the bishop b5 check move because c6 is not possible here. We just take it. And if he goes bishop d7, we take it and we basically win another tempo. Tempo, you know, this is the kind of position where we want that extra tempo to develop more rapidly. All right. And don't overthink this position. We need to understand what's, what's going on here. Okay, so we're probably going to lose this guy. So if we're losing that guy, well, c4 doesn't work, he takes. If we're losing that guy, we might as well take this guy and be up a pawn. Okay, so he defended very well here. Let's castle and develop. He's probably going to castle long. But we are up a pawn. We've got a nice position. Sometimes you got to tip your hat. I mean, sometimes the opponent defends well, and this is going to happen increasingly more often as we climb the ranks. Well, I spoke to you. So I think this is a mouse slip, although I will be honest, h6 would have been equally as bad because we would have made the same move regardless. Now... The fact that he hasn't castled is setting the alarm bells off, all right? Any situation where you have castled and your opponent doesn't sort of by definition is a situation where there's a heightened chance of tactics. And again, there's a pattern here, which is quite common, which is the notion that if his queen ends up on the e-file and the e-file gets open, then we'll be able to play rook e1. And so combining that yields the move e6. He is forced to take, we take with the knight. Yeah, and he cannot, well, he can, but it is inadvisable to take with a queen because we go rook e1. Okay. Yes. Hey, daddy. All right. Um, he's in trouble. The king is in trouble, much the same way as our previous knight on e6, right? It's preventing the king from, yeah, and so he decides to take, but... Now, this is not over. He, he should take our rook and get at least a piece and a rook for the queen. But the reason that's bad is because his king is just so weak. And he just resigned. So, yeah, got off on the wrong foot there. Okay. So that's the Philidor. Um, the, as far as I know, the, well, there's a couple of things to, to understand about this position. Um, the very common trap, bishop e7 is often played here as a way to try to stop knight g5. And it does. But after d takes c5, amazingly, black is almost lost. Because if d takes c5, what is white's move here? And we've just, we just saw 
basically this exact pattern. No, this is my last game, guys. I don't know, I'm pretty wiped. Queen d5, yeah. And again, he's got a knight h check. We literally just saw this. And if he takes with a knight, then we take his knight, and we play what move? Well, you can bribe me, but I, I, I wouldn't refuse the bribe, but I will still go to sleep. It's So it's not here, okay? And see, you, you have to be concrete. You, you know, when you're applying patterns from one position to another, you have to check, okay, maybe this position is a little bit different. And here you got to see the bishop defends the queen. But notice that this is an undefended pawn. This is a pawn which is under pressure. Combining the two yields queen h5, which is a classic fork. It's actually very hard for black to even find an adequate defense of queen f7. He's got to go here. That is an ugly move. Queen takes e5 and... Now you can go here, and this position is horrible for black. So in addition to the pawn, this king is uncastled. It's around plus two, according to the computer. White is basically winning. I've actually fallen into this myself with black. So the best move for black, I think, is to actually just take the pawn and say, yes, I'm worse. I've got less of the center, but I'm pretty solid here. All right. I do love my bribes. Proudly so. So I think that there's probably some theory behind this and i think black can play this in a better way i think this is asking for trouble and desert pagel gifting to photon six so he actually played okay until this moment but if he would have castled long i think funnily enough um we have a very powerful move in this position and again if you think very straight sometimes you want to play very straightforwardly you know, there are situations where you just want to pile up on something and that just works and this is one of those situations where you make an exception to the development rule, just go queen f3, and he basically has to try f6. But now we have what sequence of moves? If you're very attentive to the patterns here, you notice this queen, ah, we want to get a knight here. We can't do that immediately, but we can go e6, intermezzo, boom, boom, fork, winning. So constantly modulating between applying principles and also knowing when to violate them is one of the things that makes chess so exhilarating. You never know these kinds of moments are wrong. The point is to know when these moments arrive. Why not e7? Well, e7, he takes it. Or the bishop. Yeah. Well, queen e7 doesn't help. We go knight f7 anyway. That's the point, right? The pawn defends the knight. And... If he even gets to this knight, he'll be lucky. Okay. Um, now, that is why in the modern version of the Philidor, black takes, e takes d4. This is the best move. And generally, the modern players fianchetta the bishop like this. This is a legitimate variation. One that is not easy to break. And um, it, it is actually quite a hotly contested line. Black needs to be very accurate there, but it's, it's it's not like a refuted line by any means. Yeah, and also, like, th there's another version of the Philidor which starts like this. You go knight f6, knight c3, e5. Okay. And the reason is because if you try to do knight f6 here, which is a move, then you run into the additional option of white taking. And to my knowledge, this is a bad... This is considered very dubious for black. Shizuki 1348. We play solidly with black. Um, let's play another Karo. Let's play another Karo. And Karo is, of course, Sinbad Fairy, I think, for the prime. And he goes e5. Now, if you guys have been watching my blitz, there's two main moves here for black. There's c5, which is the sort of the new move. And it's been gaining popularity lately. But of course, the main move, the traditional move, the move that we are going to play is bishop f5. And we were talking about this earlier. This is precisely the line that a lot of people struggle against because it, it is a closed center. And this requires knowledge of typical ideas for black and knowledge of how to play. We've had this before, though. So hopefully um, you guys feel a little bit more at home here, those of you who have been watching the speed run. Now, what is black supposed to do here? What is black supposed to do here? What's next? So f4 is not great. It's very weakening. It blocks the bishop. Yeah, so e6, right? We need to cement the center. We need to open the bishop up. We need to make sure that we're not going to get steamrolled. And 
those of you who play the French, this is just like a French setup, except our bishop is outside the pawn chain. That's the whole point. We pay for that with a tempo. Uh, in the French, you play c5 often in one move. Here, it takes two moves. Bishop d3. So already we have a battle going on over the f5 square. And taking on d3 would be fine, but I don't want him to have the possibility of playing f4, f5 very quickly. That might lead us uh, to some trouble. So this is exactly the concept of trading on our own terms. I don't want to give away the f5 square easily. What does that mean? Well, that means that we can develop a piece and simultaneously bring the square under our protection. A lot of you are pointing out knight a7. I like this move. But what I don't like is that it blocks the bishop in. And if we fin keto, then our dark squares, particularly the square in f6, becomes really, really weak. We can circumvent this by playing knight h6. Now, I know what you guys are saying. Aren't knights on the rim grim? And I think I talked about this. The thing is, this knight's going to end up on f5, most likely. It might be a matter of a couple of moves, but this is Frankfurt Airport. We're going to f5 at some point. So don't think of this as a knight on the rim. Think of this as a transit point to f5. But h3 is a very bad move. He, he sort of forgot to castle, forgot to develop his pieces, and now he's going to pay the price. Queen h4 check forces his king to move. Doesn't win the game or anything, but obviously it's, it's pretty much a no-brainer. Corn on the cob thing for the prime. And he's going to have to decide where to put his king. Yeah. So king f1 is the best move. King e2, other moves I think are quite a bit worse. King d2 would give up the f4 pawn. Thank you, uh, the final wave. Appreciate the prime. Thanks, guys, for all the support. King f1. Now, speaking of Frankfurt Airport, uh, that's the analogy that I always have, right, to, to describe these, these ideas. You know, when I would play in tournaments in Europe, I'd always fly San Francisco, Frankfurt. Frankfurt's a great city, but uh, you move on toward your destination, whether it's Paris or, or Rome. So what should we do? Yeah, we take the bishop. Now we take... So knight g4, some of you guys are seeing. And let me just label this move so I can talk about it afterward. It doesn't work. Well, it, no, it, it, it's not that it doesn't work, but why can just defend f2 with, uh, with queen e2? And then I don't see a follow-up. We don't have enough pieces uh, to make stuff happen with. So instead, we take the bishop. And how should we follow this up? He's going to take with the queen. And then what should we do? Yeah, I don't like Frankfurt Airport. <laughs> Knight f5? Yeah, and there we go. All right. All right, queen takes d3, knight f5. Now we're threatening knight g3, so he his best move would be to develop his knight to e2 and simultaneously cover the square on g3. Now, I remind you guys the specific questions I'll address after the game. He goes knight f3. That's actually not, not so stupid because if we give a check on g3, which I know a lot of you are tempted to, to do, he's going to slide the king over to g1. And the problem there is going to be that our queen is hanging and we've got to move our queen. And that knight on g3 might get a little bit stranded there. He, he has an h2 square for his rook. So in such situations, exercising restraint can be very, you know, can be a very good idea. So I propose a move which will cause some eye rolls. Let's dip, let's get the hell out of there. The queen has done its job. The king is weak. You know, his king side is in, is in shambles. We're threatening a fork now, but we need to repurpose this queen now for potentially an attack against d4. Let's not forget that the main idea of the Karakhan in this position is to then play c5 and undermine his pawn. So this queen can swing around to b6 and attack from a distance. All right. Yeah, we can play h5 to stop g4. It depends what he does. But we don't actually have to. Knight c3. Okay, so he misses the fork. No reason for us not to win the exchange. Um, you know, in some situations you would consider not winning the exchange if the knight is strong, but it's it's not particularly good there. So, okay. 
So what should we do now? If we really want to play in solid style, if we want to play in a style that does not permit any ideas, what should we do? Even before we do, so a lot of you are saying C5, but this is actually a brief danger zone because white's developed two pieces, we've developed zero. So what I'm really worried about, what move do you guys think I'm worried about here? If it's white to move, let me put it this way. If it's white to move, what does white do here? What move am I really concerned about? <laughs> Queen e4, yes. f5, right? f5, well, it opens the bishop, it, it attacks e6, I don't like it. I don't like the look of f5, and I'll talk about that afterward, why f5 is scary. But for now, take my word for it, it is scary. Why is, I'm just writing all this down. So what should we do about it? What can we do about the threat of f5? A move that looks bad, I warn you, prophylactic. Yes, g6. Let's prevent him from going f5. Now, I mentioned previously that a move like this has the drawback of weakening f6, but he can't access it. This square on f6 is inaccessible because e4 is protected by the pawn. Even if he accesses it, we can get this bishop either to e7 or g7, and it can stand sentinel over this square. So the negatives, I think, are greatly outweighed by the positives here. So g4 is, is a move, but remember that his king is already weak. There's no rook there to protect. So this would be a win for us, because then if he plays that, okay, he plays that five anyway. Well, we should take toward the center. Let's not take with the e pawn, because then we might allow his, his e6, e5 pawn to go forward. So let's play gf. Now I see what he's trying to do here. Thank you, Will. Uh, uh, Will to ask for cash to Cajun Tierman. Maybe he wants to develop the bishop with tempo, but it doesn't really do anything. We'll just play bishop e7. Yeah, castling is weak, but we might castle long, or we might leave our king in the center. Okay, knight a4. Yeah, okay, it doesn't really affect what, what, we, what we do. Let's just get our knight out. We don't even really need to play c5 anymore. We're up material, so the priority has shifted. Our priority now is just to complete our development in a timely manner and get our king to safety one way or another. What am I already thinking about here? Okay, knight g5. We gotta be careful. Let's break this move down. Does it actually do, does it do anything? Is there a threat? I don't see one. Despite the appearance of this move, it doesn't have a threat. So I think a lot of you are probably thinking about h6 here, but, and h6 is fine. It forces the knight back. We can actually use this uh, position to our advantage. Instead of just going h6, why don't we develop our bishop and simultaneously attack the knight? Then we kill two birds with one stone, basically. And then a follow-up idea is to prepare castle long and then use the g file for an attack. But hold your horses, he's gone queen g3. I think that's a blunder. He's put the queen and the knight on the same file. Pinovich and Winovich. I mean, that's the name of an NFL official, Winovich. Nice. Okay, h6 is the threat, yeah. h4, h6 wins the knight and the game. Yep, whenever there's a queen and a minor piece on the same file and that file is open or semi-open, you don't have a pawn on that file, you should be contemplating whether that allows some sort of a tactic. Well, it will be up a rook, because remember, we're already up an exchange. So if he goes knight e6, that's a good move. Because if we take the knight, then our rook is undefended, so we have to be careful. It, but we take his queen. He takes on e6, we take his queen. He takes our queen. Then we take his knight at the end. And not only have we traded queens, which is good, but we've also won the knight. And yeah. Okay. Thank you, Blitzkrieg. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, love hearing that. That's awesome, man. That's incredible progress, 1200 to 1800.
Okay. So straightforward logic here. Thanks, guys. Okay, ninety six played. Now again, we don't take the knight because the rook is undefended. We have to take the queen. And it doesn't really matter what we take with, but if we want to be super clinical. Here's a tricky question for you guys. It, it doesn't matter. But if you want to be clinical, which way should we take? There's an interesting logic here. I think king, right? Because we want this rook on g8. And so the fastest path is to get this king out so that we can then go rook g8. Um, but yeah, no, this is fine. Because bishop f4, we have rook g4 attacking. That's an important detail. Otherwise, he would have had... Well, actually, he can go e6. But then we can still go rook g4. Yeah, perhaps I shouldn't have allowed this, but it's it doesn't matter. I don't think I blundered. Because the bishop being undefended... I shouldn't have played this move, but it's it's fine. Because rook g4 attacks the bishop. If he goes e6, he might go e6. But, but we just take the bishop, he takes our knight, and it's just a trade. Okay. Now g3 would be the best move here for white. Yeah, castling when the queens are off the board is n not nearly as important. And I would I would put it this way. If you're castling when the queens are off the board, sometimes you, it's for king safety purposes, but other times it's just to get the rook involved. <laughs> More so than the king to safety. I'm not sure what that means, lawful K, but okay. I'm not sure what you're what you're getting at, but alright. <laughs> That's I, I, I do start my streams with hey guys. Man, if okay, so this king is stranded in the corner. So we can play I mean anything wins here. P6 is fine. But I like well, either rook h8 or bishop f2. Let's go rook h8. Let's set up the discovery. Bishop f2 checkmate is the threat. If we had gone bishop f2 first, he might have gone g3 and opened up a square for him on g8. On, on g2. This is over. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's winning. Yeah, and again, I know that some people prefer blitz, and I, I've played a lot of blitz. You know, I, that will always remain the focus. Okay, check. We can do anything we want here. We can give a check and win the rook. We can check and win the knight. Let's win the knight just so just so I don't have a heart attack over over this pawn because we're just, you know we're just gonna do this. Well, it's called a speed. Run. If anybody <laughs> doesn't realize that yet, it's the speed run is a, a sort of a mock of a real speed run. Thank you, Sino. But I think if I called it like a slow run. It wouldn't have that zing to it, you know? So yes, I took some creative license. Let's check him here. And if he goes up, we checkmate him on f3. It's a brisk... No, I mean, I'm, I'm 1300. It's not like we're taking forever. All right. 100 bits. Thank you. That was a rich game. So f4. Not a great move. Again, because he's focused on protecting the center, which is understandable, but the center is well protected enough. It's time for white to focus on development, which is why knight f3 is the main move. And the main line is just to play like this. Although there are just countless setups in this position for white. All right. So f4, e6, bishop d3, knight h6. So I think this move should make sense to everybody. Again, we're not keeping this knight on h6. We are eventually going to go to f5. And we are opening leaving open the diagonal for the bishop, which is important not only because the bishop can come out to e7, but also because it makes it easier for us to then go c5. All right, h3. Mistake. White should just develop with knight f3, and white's position is totally fine here. Then we would have gone c5. We don't have to rush with taking the bishop. All right. Well, g4... Oops, sorry. Well, g4 is not possible. I mean, g, this square is protected, but we'll get to that. 
So if he plays bishop d3 here, no. Knight h6 here, he can take it. See, that's another reason why f4 isn't great. Here we, here we have to take and, and go for this position, right? And then go c5. But if he goes f4, then yes, knight h6 is a very reasonable move here. All right. So f4, e6, bishop d3, knight h6, h3 check, takes, knight f5, very simple. Now, some of you want a knight g4, and I get the temptation of this move, all right? And it works if white takes, because if he takes, now you don't want to take the rook, you give up the bishop then, you have to take here and then take the rook. Even this is not that simple, because white can go f5, but the reason I rejected this is because of a very simple move. Right? This threatens checkmate. That's all it does. So white can just play queen e2. Queen e2 to defend the square. And the issue is that you're going to run out of guess. It's a very dangerous situation, a very common mistake. Um, you know, when you're first starting, it's exciting to spot tactical patterns. So this, for example, is exciting. It's, stimu it's stimulating. You know, like, yeah, knight g4, and it's totally understandable. It's a nice, it's a pretty move. But you've got to uncouple sort of how nice a move looks from what it actually does. Um, as, and it sounds a little bit harsh, uh, but the only thing this move does is threatens checkmate on one square and everything else is undefended. So at this point, black is going to pay the price for this because the knight is still very vulnerable and the queen is very vulnerable. And this is premature, yeah, yeah. So does this make sense? Are there any specific questions about this? Now, if bishop takes d3, of course, you don't want to take with the queen. You want to take with a pawn. Yeah, ruin, but okay. You're just, this is just one pair of double pawns. It's not a big deal. And now you have to drop the knight back. And then white develops with tempo, and then white can go g4, so it's not worth it. And you know also, these pawns are actually kind of good. You know why? Because uh, it's like a snake that molts. You know, It sheds its skin, and it's, it replaces it. If black goes c5 here, what happens? Why are these double pawns actually kind of good? Who can tell me? The, and this is a pro, a, a serious pro of having these double pawns. He can undouble, but not only that. Then he can play d4, and all of these efforts have been in vain. So you can shed your skin, and then you have something underneath, basically. Now, of course, you could argue, well, black wouldn't go c5 here, but then the center would remain closed. Okay, doubled pawns can be a ph phenomenal protective force. Okay, so knight f3 again, if we check him, then he goes king g1, and this knight is going to be stuck in no man's land. Okay, so queen d8, knight c3. Okay, he should have gone king f2. Now we might have gone h5 to prevent him from going g4. Right, we serve, or we could go c5 here, and, and we could meet g4 with knight takes d4, opening up the center, and this king is going to be really weak. Your binky thing for the 11 months. All right, so why is f5 scary? Now, let's say we, we would have gone c5. First of all, if, you know, between this and, and something like bishop b7, I would have preferred something like knight d7, because we're not developed. But if you think about it, the king is weak, f5 breaks apart Black's pawn chain and opens up files and can be followed up by knight g5. I'm not calculating here. I'm just sort of intuitively concluding that this is scary. That's that's part of chess. You can't calculate everything. So I think you guys should be seeing what I'm seeing, which is that white's, white is a lead in development and white's breaking open the position. Not something I want to allow, and that's why we take time to go g6. Does that make sense? This is, a I think, a, quite an important point. So when you the, the lesson here is that when you've won material, take a moment to identify sources of danger. Just because you're up in exchange or a piece doesn't mean that your opponent no longer has any threats. All right. Well, that depends, Amor. I mean, these kinds of questions, it's hard to answer generally, but this is an example. All right. It weakens the dark surface. Like I said, chess is a game of tit for tat. You have to give something up. You have to constantly be weighing the positives and negatives. You can't play a chess game where every single move has no negatives. That's not possible. Rophylaxis is just stopping your opponent's threats. That's what it means. All right, so f5, we take it, and the rest is very simple. Attack the knight, win the knight, and uh, take with the king to facilitate and accelerate the pace at which this rook is involved. What about h6 instead of g6? 
Um, well, h6 doesn't stop f5. I get what you're trying to do. The bishop could go to f4. You're you're not getting you're getting at the the symptoms, but not the root cause. Okay. How do you know which side to castle? Well, you just choose the side that's safest. I mean, here, the queen side is not entirely safe, but fine. King's side would be like castling into a war zone. Thank you, Talarandini. All right. What if we had traded on d3 and played queen a5, a6? That's a typical idea, Sayan. Yeah, yeah. Well, gigahertz, thank you. Well, in terms of the question of uh, whether or not, oh, sorry, the board got misaligned, whether or not to open up the center, you got to decide sort of a, a rough way of thinking about this is that the center is closed. The side that is attacking on a flank doesn't want the center to open. If the center is closed and you have an attack against your opponent's king, then you don't necessarily want to break open the center because that would dilute your attention, right? V vice versa, if you are getting attacked, um, or you've completed your development and you're not sure what to do, and you feel like your pieces are better placed than your opponent's pieces, opening up the center could allow that to, you know, to be more pronounced. Uh, but it's it, these are very general guidelines. It, it, it just a lot of stuff you have to evaluate on a case by case basis. Okay. All right. Um, well, if you win g4 before we developed our knight to h6, then we give him a check. We pick off the pawn. Thank you, Jigahertz. Five gifted and another one to Texas. Hey, Tiger. Thanks, man. All right, guys.